right, so good morning, everybody. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time today, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And we just wrapped up our most epic month ever in May. Uh, alongside 40 regular scheduled programs, we also ran our Global Biodiversity Festival, the largest conservation program ever, with 150 broadcasts, over 72 straight hours of broadcasting. So that was a little bit wild. We didn't get much sleep during that. Uh, and we're slowly but surely unveiling all those programs on our YouTube channel if you want to check them out with conservationists around the globe. We also are wrapping up officially our Backyard by a Global Nature campaign. We had teachers all over the world connect with one another to share their love of nature, images of all the local wildlife that they could discover. Such a special program and so thank you to all our educators who took part in that. Now, today we are kicking off June with a bang. It is Pride Month. So where I come from in Toronto, this is a huge celebration. Uh, it's been really exciting exciting to see more and more communities, uh, countries around the world celebrate Pride Month. Uh, we have uh, Catholic schools across Ontario today that for the first time are unveiling Pride flags, which is really exciting. So if you care about diversity and representation in STEM, then welcome in today. We had a huge outpouring of support for today's programs, uh, a triple series, a triple slate of programs to kick off our epic month. So if you've joined us over the last two hours, you will have seen Hugh Griffiths from the British Antarctic Survey talk about some of the wild and wonderful wildlife at the bottom of the world. We then went all the way to the north to the Arctic in northern Nunavut with Paul Sokoloff from the Museum of Nature in Ottawa. Such a special duo of programs. And so today we are diving in with a friend of mine and someone who is joining us for the very first time on the broadcast. We are joined live by Jackie Saturno. So she is a double National Geographic Explorer grantee. Her work has had her uh, study marine plastic pollution out in Newfoundland and then work to clean up and assess and understand all that personal protective equipment being thrown on the ground throughout the entire course of the pandemic with her partner, Justine Emmentalia. Uh, we've had her on numerous times, and so this is just a really special program for me personally. I know we had a ton of classes sign up for this, and so I hope you guys are as excited as I am. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jackie to blow your minds. Thank you so, so much for joining us today, Jackie, and uh, take us away. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Jesse. I'm really excited to talk with everyone about um, what it means to be um, a queer environmental scientist in this day and age and kind of uh, talk about, you know, how I started and, and uh, you know, where I've uh, gone and, and, you know, where I've ended up essentially. Um, so I'm really stoked to be with uh, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants and um, talk to, to everyone here today and um, talk to everyone afterwards as well. So um, as uh, Jesse mentioned, um, my name is Jackie Saturno. Um, I actually um, started off my journey um, uh, within the greater Toronto area within Southern Ontario. And um, I have always had a passion for doing things that got me outside, um, being landlocked. It, it, it restricted me from doing more uh, freshwater environments, which was amazing. And it got me to work with really cool species like salmon. And um, I was um, really, you know, um, getting to a point in my life where I want to explore other parts of Canada because this this nation is is so diverse in its landscape and um, was uh, you know um, uh, absolutely a privilege to to um, you know being in southern Ontario but I wanted to see other parts as well which eventually brought me to the province of Newfoundland and Labrador and um, it was during this time where I got to work with a particular species called Atlantic salmon. And this particular species is amazing because not only are they freshwater, but they also go all the way to the ocean and um, feed there. And then they go spawn and, and reprocreate in, in river systems. So they get the best of both worlds of work of living in salt water and freshwater. And so during this time, I got to, you know, understand their migration patterns and get a sense of what they're eating and uh, really get some hands-on experience of just um, you know, being being surrounded by nature and and uh, working with salmon because um, you know being in southern Ontario doesn't always grant you the ability to like be that um, interactive with nature if you're if you're in a city environment. And so it was during this time where I got to you know think and ask some questions about about the environment and and really dive deep into you know not just you know the nature aspect but things like contamination. And it was during this time where we start to explore other um, um, pressures on the environment, you know, whether it be climate change. And, and in this particular sense, it was about plastic pollution and, and fish that were eating plastics and being harmed by it. So while this isn't a picture of an Atlantic salmon per se, it was kind of one of the first images that kind of got me thinking about, um, you know, the vulnerability that animals have about eating things that they shouldn't be eating. 
And it got me thinking about the salmon that I had been working with all summer, about if they were eating things that they shouldn't be eating and if they were being impacted by that beyond then, you know, them just eating things that they you know, like 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 capelin and, and other small species that they should be eating. And so, um, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, brings us to the question about about uh, the impacts of plastic pollution on the environment. It comes with entanglement where, where species get caught in netting and then they, they, they unfortunately pass because they, they can't get away or they eat um, plastics that kind of get stuck inside their gut and they can't pass it through or even through other um, things like smothering where nets that are so big they can fall in the environment and they can hurt them in that um, aspect. And so this brought me to, you know, wanting to, to work with the salmon and um, seeing if they were eating any plastics. So um, I then uh, joined a lab where that allowed me um, to, to, to bring this project to that and dissect them and learn the techniques of identifying plastics from organics and, and um, um, you know, looking further and to see if they were. And through this experiment, I actually wasn't, you know, they, the, the salmon were all clear. I didn't see any plastics. Um, but that didn't kind of um, you know, stop my curiosity there. I, I was um, wondering about, you know, what plastic pollution was impacting other species. Um, in Newfoundland Labrador, if you ever um, heard about this species called Atlantic cod, they're very, very important to Newfoundlanders. They're, um, they're um, used in the fisheries. Um, if you're ever out east, you'll probably um, have eaten them if you had fish and chips. And um, there had been previous studies uh, had been, that had been done that had found these kind of suspicious looking nylon blue threads that were found in their guts. And, um, you know, part of working with plastic is, is not only just finding the occurrence of it, but you kind of want to prevent this from happening further. And so um, identifying the sources is kind of a big part of, 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 of this type of work. And combing the beaches of Newfoundland and Labrador, I started to see these threads that I wasn't normally familiar with ever seeing in, in, you know, with litter in, New, in, in southern Ontario. These are kind of like these long suspicious threads kind of um, resembled something that um, is used quite often in Newfoundland and that is fishing rope. Fishing rope is very important um, um, aspect in the fishing industry um, because it's used to, to catch to catch thread, but uh, catch fish. But unfortunately, they're they're also made out of plastic, which you know if they get lost in the environment or start to break down, they don't uh, they don't go away. Um, so, you know, this um, led me to my next kind of um, opportunity to take on my own field work. Um, um, where I got to explore my own questions and, and dive and, and explore this further, where I got to uh, be funded by National Geographic to go to this island called Fogo Island, which is right off the coast of Newfoundland and Labrador. It's a very um, important uh, um, island because it's used for fishing for Atlantic cod. And so I wanted to go to this community and um, explore if, if they were actually catching fish that were impacted by fishing gear related plastics. And it was there where I got to see fishing ropes being used, to, you know, uh, right in their natural environment, where um, they're used in very abrasive conditions. The ocean is is very turbulent with its winds, and and the ropes are being tied and rubbed against each other, and um, you know, are exposed to the um, the sun and and the water that just kind of breaks them down over time. And um, you know, it it. it uh, if it does, you know, you know, break down, it doesn't just dissipate into the environment or biodegrade is what you know we call it. It actually breaks down into smaller plastics called microplastics, uh, which then make um, species like Atlanta called vulnerable to eating them because they get so small that they get mistaken for food all the time. And even just by cutting the rope, you can just see the frayed bits of plastic that come off and, um, you know, um, just simply by just cutting the ropes in half. Um, so even just by slicing it, you know, I get to see it firsthand, all the different, different fragments and it kind, of get, kind of made me wonder about, you know, uh, plastics that are going into the environment. Um, but beyond just doing plastic work, um, this work um, was special to me only also because I got to go to communities that I probably would never have gone to before. Um, being from Southern Ontario, the chances of me going to Fogo Island and, and seeing this community and working with people was probably something I wouldn't have been able to do in my lifetime if it wasn't for, you know, being an environmental scientist and, and getting to do that, which is crucial because 
working with communities is a big part of, of science in, in, in every aspect. It's not just about going and collecting data and analyzing it, coming out with results. It's also about working with other people and, and asking questions that were affected for them and, and seeing, you know, um, um, what, 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 are, what are their concerns about the fishing industry and, and um, you know, working hand on hand. Um, so working with a community is, is something that is super important to this type of work. And with that, you know, in the spirit of Pride Month, um, I wouldn't be able to do this type of work without working with my, my dear partner, Justina Mendelia. And, um, you know, it, it, it was beyond just like getting an extra pair of hands to work on. This is something that was so important to me because it wasn't something I could imagine myself doing five years ago. Um, coming out of the closet was like a very gradual process for me. It was something that um, took time and patience. And, I, you know, there were times where I wouldn't even feel comfortable talking to my colleagues about it. And so being able to be out and working with my partner, um, not just as like my, my you know, plastics pollution researcher, but as like my life partner to to uh, spend time together was, was something that was just so, so important to, to do. And, and it was a, a memory that I get to look back on that's, that's very fond, that's very fond to me. Um, and, you know, with this, uh, um, although um, I didn't actually find any plastics with the salmon, um, we found these bait bags that were stuck inside the guts of Atlantic's Atlantic cod, which is um, mind blowing to myself because these big plastics took up the entire stomach linings of the cod and just imagining them swimming in the ocean and having them stuck in their guts, they probably wouldn't survive. These particular fish ended up, you know, being filleted and are, you know, were used in the fishing industry, but, um, you know, considering that the cod, they essentially eat anything, makes them so susceptible to plastic pollution. And the thing about um, plastic pollution, like I mentioned before, not only do we want to know about the occurrence, but we want to know about the source. And with this, I knew exactly where those plastic bags were coming from. They were used to hold the bait that were then used to attract cod. So it was, you know, an exciting moment, um, not only because, you know, we found results, but because we know I knew exactly where it was coming from, and we can actually make effective change to, you know, um, um, prevent this from happening from from, hap from um, other Atlantic cod in the future by knowing that they, you know, come from these fishing gear and just modifying it and preventing that from happening. So it was a very exciting time to just, you know, make something that was an impactful change with that. But you know, um, there's also other types of sources. So um, like I mentioned before, fishing rope is a huge part of, of this. And, and that kind of made me want to explore other types of, of uh, fishing gear and their impacts. I got to know it with bait bags and you know its ingestion, but I also want to again, further explore fishing ropes. But with that, I didn't want to do any experiments in the ocean and, and got, you know, prevent more plastics from going in the environment. I had to take my field work and bring it towards a lab-based experiment and create the environment. So with this, you see a massive green tub that's filled with water. I was trying to represent um, a marine environment where I got to um, replicate abrasion and, and um, those kind of weathered exper um, uh, conditions on ropes to then um, create the fraying that um, you you, I showed you before and see all the plastics that go into the, into the water and then collect them afterwards and see how much I was seeing. And so this is another um, image of, of, of what the uh, experiment looked like. Essentially, it's a green tub with water and a big board with rocks on it to um, um, represent the ocean floor. Because as I said before, the, the, the ocean was so abrasive that um, the ropes were just like rubbing and being tugged and, and fishermen were tying them. And so I wanted to make the same sort of abrasion environment um, that you would normally see in a real life setting. And this is just a, another side of the board where it's like all the rocks that you would probably see on an ocean floor that the ropes would be rubbing against. And so with that, I also um, used some um, different types of techniques to catch the, the netting. And so it, it involved a lot of adaptability of, of using nets to catch um, plastics that float in the water and um, in addition to using nets to, to catch the ones that sink. And so this is a video that also demonstrates the abrasion rubbing back and forth.
So sometimes science, you know, doesn't just bring you into the environment, but it also brings you to a lab setting where you're creating your own environment. And so this is um, just from a simple five minute test which you, you get to see all the different fraying that happens from, from rope that are very, very strong. But you know, if they're being rubbed against rocks the wrong way, they can start to fray and start to emit plastics into the environment. And um, over time, it starts to get worse and worse and more plastics start to shed as you can see. And this mason jar is just like after about 10 minutes or so of all the different plastics that I was able to collect from, from the experiment. But, you know, um, sometimes, you know, you're brought as an environmental scientist, you're brought to different parts of, of, of um, um, the world. Um, and sometimes you're actually brought back home to it, too. So um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, after, you know, doing these different types of projects, we Justine and I eventually had to go home to, you know, go into lockdown. And that kind of made us think about the future of our work. You know, we, we were used to going off to far off places to do field work. We're used to um, going into lab settings and doing um, our experiments within a contained environment with all these different resources. But now we were back home and we you know, didn't have those accessibility uh, tools at our disposal. Um, and so we kind of had to start thinking about, you know, what kind of questions we could ask. And, and um, we were putting, you know, our plastic minds to work through that. And um, just from simple walks around the neighborhood, we started to notice what you probably have seen yourself, um, PPE litter everywhere. We would see face masks that were every, people would normally use to protect themselves from COVID-19. We would see them like, you know, in garden beds. We would see disinfectant wipes just like on, you know, in the streets that, you know, people use to wipe down surfaces. We'd also see just, uh, you know, disposable gloves as well. So, and um, it, it really um, started to make us wonder about uh, if, if this is something we should explore. And as more and more time went on, we would see them everywhere. We would see them in grocery stores, we would see them in nature parks. And this became a problem that, you know, was went beyond just a, a simple observation. It became something where Justine and I were thinking that we probably should, you know, start to take action on it and start to monitor. And so we transformed our, our, our evening walks and our walks around our communities that, you know, we did just to get some simple exercise. And we thought, why don't we just, you know, use this to, to, to do some good and, and actually um, um, start to monitor this problem. It's, it's a type of debris that we haven't seen before, and we wanted to see exactly what was happening with that. And so um, we didn't have our, you know, our resources at our disposal, given that we weren't in the lab and we weren't in the field. So we had, you know, the opportunity to use this 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 app, this a cell phone app called Marine Debris Tracker. And what's amazing about this app is that anybody can use it. It's free. It's accessible to non-scientists. So anybody, you know, even children can go out and 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 use it. Um, essentially, you you um, it's it's an app where you just um, collect an item and then you can map it. And so it goes into a database afterwards and um, can then be used by other scientists as well. So it goes beyond just collecting garbage and, and then just putting it away. It can actually be used to collect data. And so, um, you know, as, 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 as simply as put, we, we went out and Justine was um, downloaded the app and then started tracking it on her cell phone. Um, every time we would go out, we would collect all the different types of litter we would find um, that was related to COVID-19, where it's face masks and gloves. And Justine would start logging it into her phone while I would go collecting it using a long stick. So, you know, very, very simple resources, but it was, um, you know, became very, very profound. And, you know, um, we also had to think about where we were going to do it. So before we were going to far off places to go do our, 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 our collections. But this time we had the opportunity just to do it simply in our backyard. We went to parking lots for grocery stores that we were finding plastics everywhere. We were going to the hospital district, downtown Toronto, to see the streets and, and collecting and, and um, doing data collections there, as well as residential roads and, and also nature parks as well. We were seeing PPE absolutely everywhere. And, you know, it was it was times like this where it made us wonder, like, you know, we didn't have to go off to far off places. We could just stay in our within our communities to um, do this type of work and, and make the impacts that we we saw in our, our own backyards, which was was you know mind blowing to us. Because as environmental scientists, you think that sometimes you have to go to um, exotic areas or or have all the money in the world to run these experiments. But being a scientist made us wonder, you know, think about we could actually just do things in our own backyard. And you know the impact from that was astonishing because um, you know 
like before, like, you know, um, you know, being a scientist, I never thought I'd make this mu as much impact as, as I, as I thought I would being home in Toronto. I thought I would have to leave my hometown and, 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 and go off, but I got to, you know, um, be with my partner and, um, do this type of work on a local basis and make this impact on a national level by inspiring other people of, of doing this type of work because it's, it's accessible to everybody. You know, everyone has a concern about, about plastic pollution, but, you know, a lot of the times we feel very helpless and, you know, wonder that, you know, it's, it's only for the scientists to figure out and it's only for those who, who, um, you know, can go into like the, you know, different parts of the world. But accessing our own backyard has been probably the one of the most impactful parts about it because everyone can relate to it to a bigger degree. And it's times like this where, you know, like we celebrate pride and it's, you know, it's more than just, you know, a time where, um, you know, it's, it's you know, just um, being our authentic selves. It's also um, wondering, you know, what kind of scientist one can look like. It can be somebody who, um, you know, just, look, you know, looks like you and I and, um, you know, it, it begs the question of what, what does science look like? And um, it was times like this where I didn't think I would be able to um, work with my partner and be out and open, you know, as simple as five years ago. Times have changed like so much where we can actively work and, and, and you know, be our authentic selves and, and um, do this amazing work on, on a, a daily basis. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's wonderful to take this opportunity to, um, you know, talk with everybody and um, explain and, and show that, you know, what it means to be a queer scientist because it's, it's constantly changing. So with that, I want to thank everyone and uh, thank you very much for having me for this session. Jackie, thank you for such a nice presentation. Not only uh, highlighting your personal story, but highlighting such fantastic research. It's so cool to see research in action as well. Pretty rare opportunity for us uh, at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. So I'll, I'll leave your email up for a minute. If people do want to follow up with more questions, you now have the option to do so, uh, which is great. We've got at least 10 classes joining us on YouTube, plus our live groups so of 350 kids across the continent are tuning in for this, which is awesome. Uh, if you do want to exit your screen share now, come back to, to me and we'll have a bit of a conversation with our live groups. What a special program, guys. Um, I want to highlight two quick things, or, or one quick thing to start. You mentioned the Debris Tracker app, and I know that we're going to get a bunch of questions about this, so I'm going to bring it up on our screen, debristracker.org, if you guys want to check this out. We have featured this on the broadcast tons of times in our marine plastic programs in the past, so I really encourage you guys to check that out. Download it as a class, use it, and see if you can help contribute to the amazing research uh, that Jackie, uh, her partner Justine, and so many others are doing around the world. So what a cool app and what a cool opportunity for you guys. Uh, Jackie, I want to dive in with questions. I'm going to start with our, our Tribune Trailblazers, Ms. McIntosh's class, joining us in Brampton. If you want to kick us off, uh, come on in. Awesome. We have a question from Harish. Harish, are you good? Hello. My name is Harish, and my question is, what are the chances of us eating plastic in fish? That's a very good question. Um, so as we do our, our, you know, our work and we're developing more and more, um, there are certain defined traces of plastics within fish, which, you know, start to, you know, make people wonder, like, you know, are, are we not supposed to be eating fish anymore? But, you know, that that is a complicated question. But, you know, I would say that it's still such a small, small amount that I wouldn't rule it out completely. Um, I don't have an answer about, you know, how much because it does vary between species. Um, but you know, it's, 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 it's not something to alarm anybody that like, if you're eating fish that, you know, you're going to get sick in any way, you're going to be fine. Um, but it's, it's something where, you know, we need to, um, take action now before it starts to get more and more, uh, more of a problem. So, you know, it's something that has been developed in development, um, for the past few decades of finding plastics in fish. Um, but we're still answering the questions about, you know, what the effects are. Um, so at the moment, we're taking preventative um, action towards um, trying to reduce plastic pollution in the ocean, which is um, the best way to go because we don't want to wait until it's you know gets too out of hand and becomes way too big of a problem. Um, so um, you know at the moment, you know no one needs to to worry about that um, per se, but um, to keep it on their mind that uh, we want to um, prevent this from getting uh, worse down the line nip it in the bud as soon as we can. And I think that's something that's really important about plastic pollution. Uh, and it's something that's, uh, you know, actually a great thing about it as an issue is that it's totally apolitical. No one looks at a beach covered in plastic and goes, great. No one thinks about fish eating plastic that we subsequently eat and goes, oh, how fantastic. <laughs> 
want to eat that plastic, right? So we all recognize that this is an issue. And I think that certainly our younger generation, the kids in today's classrooms are already taking a lot of action to do this. And it's something that is nice too, because we can all do it at home. So I'm sure we'll get more questions on that throughout the broadcast, but I, I think that's a great first question. All right, I want to head to Miss Howard's class. They're joining us in Ottawa. We've had so many Ottawa classes today. It's ridiculous. I love it. So just unmute your mic and come on in. Miss Howard. Hello. Uh, thank you. Okay, so I've got a lot of questions coming at me, um, but I think uh, what um, what type of plastic do you find pollutes the most? Oh, wow. Okay, so um, it's definitely um, varies quite often, but I think, you know, where our minds kind of go, it's like, you know, seeing plastic straws because they get promoted quite often. But in um, retrospect, or in, in reality, actually, um, a lot of them are um, food packaging um, that go beyond just that and also construction um, related plastics. And um, also to note that most plastics are land based sourced. So about 80% or so and, and about 20 are about um, marine source, which include fishing gear. So I, you know, it sometimes it depends geographically, because when I was in Newfoundland, you know, a lot of the times, when I'm beach combing, most of the plastics that I see are fishing gear related, which makes sense because, you know, it's a fishing town, it's a fishing province, uh, fishing is used all the time, it's it's constantly being used in the water. Um, so from my personal experience, I would see that. But of course, coming back to Ontario, I would see, I would, you know, never see any fishing gear related, obviously. Um, I'd seen plenty of PPE that was, you know, a lot of uh, um, what I would see um, while I was doing it, of course, that's kind of where I'm geared towards. But um, um, it, it's, it's sometimes it depends on the environment that you're, you're at, but on, on a, you know, on a, a, a grand scheme of things, um, the, one of the biggest polluters is, is, is packaging, food packaging and, and construction related plastics. I think one of the things that's nice about the food related packaging is again, it's one of those things that we can all make a big difference on. So when you go to the group. Mm -hmm. Or you don't need that plastic bag if you're getting something like a banana or an apple that has sort of a built-in peel with it. Uh, if you get a grocery bag, you can take your own. If you pack a lot, you go to school, you can pack a littlest lunch. So these things really do make a big difference. Um, I, I'm actually quite astonished to hear that 20% of the plastic is marine source. I would have thought it was significantly less than that. So there you go. I, I think that there's a, a call for, for better fishing gear management if that's the case. <laughs> Um, let's head to Massachusetts. We're going to go to Ms. Lee's class. They're joining us in Lawrence. Uh, come on in, unmute your mic, and then we'll go to your, your companion class. Uh, right now, guys. Hi, Ms. Lee. Hello. Um, so one question I got is that you had mentioned earlier that you found a lot of PPE around during COVID. Um, so one of the students asked which PPE did you find most common laying mm -hmm. around, like masks or wipes or gloves? Very good question. Actually, so um, the interesting thing about that is that was why we were testing, we were going out and checking out different parts of the city where, where it would be um, um, uh, the hospital district and, um, you know, grocery store parking lots, residential areas, because they did vary about, um, you know, what types of PPE. So when we were doing the hospital districts, you know, no, no competition, there was masks that, that were the heaviest. Um, when we went to grocery stores, there were um, more wipes. Um, so it, it did vary quite a bit. I think on an overall scale, it was um, gloves that um, made up the most amount of plastics. Um, but it was certainly really interesting to see because, you know, even in grocery stores, um, if you've ever been to, you know, your local grocery store, you might notice that there's like either hand sanitizer or wipes being um, distributed out so that people can just grab it and, you know, disinfect whatever that they, they are touching. And that was what we noticed when we were doing grocery store parking lots is that wipes were constantly absolutely everywhere. And then, of course, hospital areas, um, you know, masks are constantly being used. So uh, we saw a lot of masks there. I think one of the things that, you know, certainly as classes we can all take away from this is that it really is important to throw your trash in the garbage can. Uh, there's no need to finish up with your mask and chuck it on the ground. There's absolutely, it's absolutely unnecessary. Now, of course, sometimes they'll blow away, sometimes they'll come out. We can all really do our part to make sure that this doesn't happen. We, we want to work Jackie out of her job. We want to make sure <laughs> plastic to pick up on the side of the road or outside of hospitals. That, I think, would be the best solution of all. Exactly. Uh, yeah. If I could be unemployed from this position, it actually wouldn't be 
a bad thing because I think we all collectively don't want plastic pollution. <laughs> you are more than smart enough. I'm sure you'd find all sorts of other fantastic things to research. So I hope that that happens too. I've been getting better. To, I actually, I, I don't know that. You're the one doing the research. But if uh, from a, a qualitative observation, there's less plastics out in grocery store parking lots than I saw before. So maybe people are getting the memo. Maybe people are just using them less. I don't know the situation. Maybe we'll we'll find out throughout the rest of the broadcast. I know we are at the stage where there's like a horde of questions coming in on YouTube. It's like endless. It's very exciting. Um, I want to head to YouTube for our next question, actually, and then I'll, I'll head to our other Massachusetts class. Um, Ms. Trim Pleasure, there are grade 11 health environmental learners in London, Ontario. They want to know, how do you get funding from National Geographic? If their kids wanted to, to finish this broadcast and apply for grants, how would they end up like you? That is a great question. Um, you know, the application process was, um, you know, how you would figure any application where you have to like talk about yourself, talk about your project. But the thing about National Geographic that separates them from other science grants is that they care a lot about story and, you know, you know, beyond than just you know what are the results and what's the quantitative number and all that stuff so you know it, it begs the question of of not just being a good scientist but um you know working on sharing that science because science isn't you know good for anybody if it's not being shared so if if you know it's something that's that piques your interest down the line it would you know focus on learning about this the the the, the science of storytelling and also um, being as curious as possible and, and just looking at your world around you and seeing how things connect. Um, those are the, the first you know, fundamental things to, to, to learn. And then you know, eventually when you, um, you, know, you know, get to an age where you can qualify to uh, apply for grants, then that would be the step steps to take. And also like explore what uh, National Geographic does have to offer for kids of your age group, because they do like to have different competitions, whether it's like little science fairs um, to get, you know, you excited about uh, science and, and get you exposed to the, you know, the, the world of, of National Geographic. So I would start there. I would see, you know, you know, at this age right now, stay curious and um, um, don't be afraid to compete and, and um, um, see what they have in store for you. What a fantastic answer. I love that. Um, let's head to our second class of the Community Day Charter School. Fourth graders, if you guys want to unmute your mic, welcome in. Uh, our, our kids in a classroom, it's crazy. What a concept. I love it. Um, <laughs> welcome in, guys. So yeah, unmute your mic, and then you'll be good to go to ask a question if you'd like. Bottom of your screen, little microphone symbol. Oh, no, gone entirely. There we go. Hi. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, we just wanted to know what is the most common um, plastic that the, is found in the salmon? Yeah. So the salmon that I had found, that had dissected actually didn't have any plastics, um, which is, you know, surprising to me. But at the same time, after further investigation, it made sense because at the time that I had, you know, we had captured the salmon and, you know, they were used for other experiments, um, they weren't, they were fasting during that time. So um, even when I was dissecting their stomachs, their stomachs were so, so small because they had just finished eating. And I, you know, um, wasn't able to do in any experiments on the salmon while they were out in, in the ocean. Um, so um, I had to kind of work with what I had there, but there was an interesting observation that um, you know, uh, salmon in during while they're in the rivers, most likely probably won't have um, have have any plastics because they're they're not eating during that time. Um, but for the Atlantic cod, um, um, they all the plastics that I did find, which wasn't very many, you know, in retrospect, I think I had about 200 guts that I dissected. There were only about uh, two of them that had bait bags, and that's fishing gear related. So um, you know, two for two, I had fishing gear related um, plastic plastics that I had found. Yeah. Oh, how about that? I, by the way, 200 guts is a lot of guts to dissect. <laughs> you, you might think that's a small sample size. I don't know. It seems like a lot for me, but very, very cool. Luckily, I had help. <laughs> actually, um, you, you made me think of a program that we've had on in the past for any kid that wants to see like a live dissection looking for plastics, in this case, inside seabirds. Anna Ruth Robach has done a bunch of programs with us that are awesome on our channels. If you want to check those out on YouTube, it's a really great follow-up to today's presentation. By the way, that is a fantastic mug, Jackie. I love it. I'm a <laughs> aficionado in the background here. Um, you may actually answered a bunch of questions already on YouTube. Miss Langer, I'm going to come to you next live, but I want to share this one from Miss Galbraith's class. They want to know, how will you use the data collected with the app, and how is the data helpful to make a difference? Mm, okay. 
How will they use the data collected in the app? Okay, so um, Marine Debris Tracker is an open source um, app. So anybody who's using it, um, um, scientists can have access to it and they can you know, see it and, 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 and um, you know, are able to, to look into it. So um, the cool thing about our, our work right now is that we're trying to go beyond um, Toronto and you know, targeting other cities and getting a, a good uh, understanding of the plastic pollution landscape related to COVID. Um, in other other parts of the city, so um, you know, people that we know are using the app, and you know, we're able to to access it and incorporate it within our our data set. So that's the cool part. So you know, um, it's it's a good feeling to go out and and collect and and uh, clean the environment by doing simple cleanups. That's that's totally great. Um, but you you can take a step further by using this app to actually put towards. Um, you know, data, a data that can, you know, be used by somebody um, like a scientist who um, might um, want to to use this data. So it's it's a great uh, app to look into um, because it, it's, it's going beyond just cleaning your environment. It's it's data that's going to, it, it can be used. There's no guarantee, but it can be used towards a greater good and um, just, you know, getting a better sense of, of plastic pollution in everyone's environment. And this is a thing behind citizen science, right? A lot of our teachers might have used the iNaturalist app for our backyard bio program, and we got a lot of questions about that. How is this actually going to be used? Well, in the past, you know, there'd have to be a horde of researchers like you going out and collecting this data personally, right? You know, with scientific engagement, writing it all down, sharing it with one another through papers. And nowadays, with this amazing app, anyone can help that effort. So mm -hmm. you can see at a glance, okay, PPE was found in all these places around the world, more so here and less so here, and chart that and, and assess that. So it basically takes out the, the bulk of that original work where you have to get out and go exploring. You can still do that yourself and you bring this experienced and, and educated approach to it. But with this data, if it's done well, it can really make a huge difference in terms of, of you know, learning a lot more about the world around us. Uh, Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup is something in partnership with OceanWise out in Vancouver. Uh, they love using citizen science. And so this really does make a big difference. Um, and again, debritracker.org if you guys want to download this as a class. We've got time for three more questions. Time flies and you're having fun, Jackie. Um, <laughs> Go to Ms. Langer's class. They're joining us in Coburg. And then Ms. Betson and Mr. Audie are going to come next. So Ms. Langer, go on in. Hi, Jackie. Thank you for joining today. Um, uh, Tatiana in my grade four class asked if you had seen a shark. And so I said, well, can you reword that so that it would include part of the question of what we're dealing with today, which is ocean plastics? So she's thinking about the nets that you were talking about. And she's wondering um, if the sharks um, are feeding on prey that would also have plastics within them or be caught within those nets or eating the plastic from those nets, and then the shark eats those fish. Um, is is this a problem in our with our ocean marine life? That is a very good question. So um, that is you know the effects of of like trophic transfer, uh, where plastics and the chemicals can you know then be leached off into uh, bigger animals that eat them. That's like, something that's constantly being explored. But something that like I've you know come to to um, witness while I was out on the fishing boats and um, you know um, you know seeing it firsthand is that you know the stomachs that eat the plastics you know um, a lot of the times the guts get thrown back overboard because there's not really a need for, you know no one really eats fish guts so um, it did beg the question of you know. Uh, what would eat these guts afterwards because they'll eventually eat whatever is inside those guts as well. So those nets that were within the guts, if I say a shark came around and, you know, saw them, they would easily eat them and, and contain with whatever's inside. So yes, it is possible for, you know, a bigger animal to come and eat them. And then, the, you know, the possibility of plastics being transferred, um, that, that all comes into play as well, especially when the plastics are nicely enwrapped in, in a tasty, tasty fish gut um, for, for a shark to enjoy. Um, but also, yeah, with, with the entanglement as well, that is an, an also a problem. So it is a possibility. Tasty fish gut for a shark to enjoy, <laughs> a great phrase for any broadcast. We could have advertised it with that. <laughs> um, by the way, Ms. Langer, thank you for taking a question and, and segueing it into the theme of the day. I really appreciate that. Uh, that was awesome. All right, Ms. Betson, uh, joining us in Cordis, if you want to unmute your mic, come on in. 
and we'll wrap up in a minute with one more of Mr. Lottie. Hello, thank you, Jackie, for what uh, it was a great presentation. Um, so I have a question here from one of my students, Logan, and she mm -hmm. asked, do you work with any groups that are trying to stop plastic from going into the ocean? Mm. So um, currently, you know, as I mentioned before, we want to, we're expanding our project. So we are, uh, we did win another National Geographic grant um, for our projects. Um, that we're going to be working with over the summer. Um, and a lot of the times um, um, working on this particular issue um, brings in you know, different types of colleagues that might not necessarily be plastic pollution researchers, but like some people who are just very, very passionate. So um, this is an exciting time for us because we're working with other citizens um, who just have a simple passion for plastics and, and want to get involved and use the Marine Debris Tracker app. You know, other passionate scientists that might be studying other types of uh, things like coral and, and, and other, other species, but um, have a passion about preventing plastic pollution. Um, so currently, um, you know, I'm not working, we're not working with like a particular, you know, nonprofit per, per se, but we're working, you know, um, on this National Geographic grant and, um, you know, seeing how it unfolds um, on an international level. In the past, I've worked with other um, nonprofits for my time on Fogo Island when I was doing my field work. I was working with the Surefast Foundation, which um, specializes on um, community-based research and um, doing sustainable fishing, which is great because got, they got me in touch with all the fishermen. So working with different organizations is great because it, it connects researchers um, with locals um, and um, bring uh, you know bridges the, the gap right there because sometimes um, you know relationship building is is um, a, a tricky uh, it's it's difficult to build if if you're just focused on the science so working with nonprofits is is a, is key to to doing so, some successful science for sure yeah. i would encourage uh miss bates and class all our teachers today check out our, our listing of all our past programs with marine plastics we have featured so many amazing nonprofits working in this space but truly national geographic is leading the charge on this they have their planet or plastic initiative uh, a series of amazing programs articles stories all on their website Check those out, Planet or Plastic, a really, really special program slate. Um, and so, uh, Jackie, again, so congratulations that you guys got a second grant that does not happen very often for many employers. <laughs> so kudos to you for your amazing work. And uh, I want to wrap up with Mr. Audi's class before I share a few quick resources. So come on in and uh, take us away. Hi, um, this is a question comes from Hashida in class 6-9, and she's wondering, do the plastics in the, o in the ocean impact directly or indirectly other foods in the sea, such as seaweed and kelp? Mm, that's a good question. Um, in terms of seaweed um, and kelp, um, that's I'm not entirely a, a super familiar of, of, of the of the impacts per se. So I would have to get back to you on that one. Um, but off the top of my head is um, you know an impact that can definitely help their their environments is 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 smothering, which is like what I mentioned before when netting kind of falls onto an environment and, and it kind of smothers it um, from, 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 you know, being successful and thriving. Um, so the, it does have impacts in, in that regard. Um, but um, with regards to other types of, of impacts, um, I don't know off the top of my head, yeah. but smothering is definitely a big impact from, from netting. And these are complicated questions. I mean, marine plastics is a research field that has only really come into existence in the last 10, 15 years in earnest in a really big way. And so there's so much active work being done to understand this. It's why there's such success with these amazing apps like Debris Tracker. Um, and so, uh, Jackie, I just want to thank you so, so much for spending time with us today, sharing your expertise and these great stories. Um, if National Geographic is all about supporting stories, then they chose a fantastic person in you. Uh, and so I, I really appreciate this. <laughs> thank you so much, Jesse. This, is, this has been great. Yeah. Uh, before we wrap up, everyone, I do want to uh, stress again, it is Pride Month. As our backdrop behind us, we've got the uh, forget. Oh, geez, I forget the title. We started today with a pride flag for Hugh Griffith's presentation to kick off the day. And so you might know the name for this, Jackie. It's a it's a better pride flag. It's like a progressive one. Or what's it called? Do you know offhand? Um, I don't. But it does. I know it does include like more than just like you know the LGBT. It includes yeah. like people of color and yeah. trans people as well, um, which is a lot more inclusive and um, um, you know it it, it cre creates a lot more diversity and, and people who are a lot more marginalized than you know 
just your average LGBT person. Which is a really fantastic message. I think that, you know, one of the things about today and today has just been a really fantastic program slate is that it goes well beyond June 1st. It goes well beyond June. Mm -hmm. Representation and diversity in STEM matter so, so much. And you highlighted really thoroughly in your presentation how this is a big thing for you personally to be able to be yourself and to be able to be out in science and to be able to, you know, work with your partner in an open way and get funding from National Geographic and all these amazing things that you get the chance to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that for kids these days and a lot of our classes, you know, this this picture of a scientist or explorer is really rapidly changing to the point where kids really recognize that no matter what they look like, no matter what their gender, no matter what their sexual orientation, there's a role for them in the scientific community, which I think is a really special and important message on, on this day more than any other. So Jackie, thank you for being a part of, of such a fun program. And I really, yeah, just uh, I keep up the amazing work. Thank you so much, Jen. Awesome. Well, I know it's your first program with us, so what we do at the end of every one of our programs, I'm going to bring in all our teachers to say a big thank you and goodbye before we wrap up. So, Miss Lee, uh, Miss McIntosh, Miss Howard, our other community day charter, Miss Langer, Miss Jason, there's so many of you, Mr. Audie, thank you so much, guys. Have a wonderful